good? You want to try it? Okay. I speak loud, so I can speak as loud as you need me to talk. ready to get started? Are we there? All right. Well, we're uh, very happy to have all of you here. It's great to see all of you that are friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got some, uh, some visitors that are here with us, and uh, we just want to welcome you here with us this evening. Uh, this has been a, a great series. It's something that, uh, that we've started doing every summer now, where we take specific subjects, of course, and Different guys within the church are able to stand up here, and, and I'm just honored to be able to, to be numbered with uh, those that have been up here and, and doing these, uh, these lessons and these Bible studies. Uh, the, uh, the subject tonight is, is godliness. And I thought, well, that would be a pretty easy subject because when you just say godliness, it just kind of sounds like we're just going to be like God. We're going to try to be as much like God as we can. And so this is going to be pretty simple. Where the good thing is... If you've ever put together lessons, and, and I do a lot of teaching and have over the last 30 years uh, in the secular world, the fire service and that sort of thing, you, you always learn more when you prepare a lesson, of course, than when you, when you take any type of class. And so as we started digging through this, it was something I didn't know at the time, but God was really putting something in front of me that I needed. And so this was just amazing for me to be able to go through this. And, and I hope that through the words that, uh, that the Spirit puts in my heart tonight, uh, as I talk to you, I hope that it has an uh, effect on you and, and strengthens you and your walk with Christ. So the first thing that, uh, that we want to talk about is what is godliness? I need to make sure this thing is moving. Um, the word godliness used by Peter in the scriptures that we're looking at here as we're talking about uh, building a Christian, basically the building blocks to being a Christian, comes from the Greek word that he used, which is uh, eusebia. Okay, and that comes from the root word of eusebis, which means well reverent. Okay, so godliness, the, the Greek word means well reverent, and it basically breaks down into two meanings. And we're going to talk a little bit about one. I really want to focus more on the other. The first one being a reverent fear or respect for God because of who God is and what God is. You know, I remember, uh, of course, this kind of dates myself a little bit. In the late 70s, there was a movie that came out called Oh God. And it was a very controversial movie, and I was, I was very young at that time, but you know, being in the church uh, where I was at, I remember it caused quite a, st uh, quite a stir throughout the nation because it was about God coming to earth in the form of George Burns. Those of you that are old like me remember who George Burns was. Uh, and, and coming in contact with, uh, with John Denver, the country singer. And it was basically a plot uh, or a basis for a comedy movie. And I remember it stirred up quite a, uh, a bit of controversy because of the fact that really God had not been portrayed by anyone like George Burns in a movie. You know, we had Charlton Heston, The Ten Commandments, and it was all about God's glory. But this is one of the first times that God was actually used as a background or part of a plot in a movie for entertainment purposes, especially in comedy. And so we can see advancing past that as our country and our world has changed, it becomes more and more and more common for God to be a, a plot line or for God to be a, um, a line in a joke or something of that nature. And so, in 1 Chronicles 29, 11, um, David, as he's preparing all of the, uh, all of the materials that are going to be needed for Solomon to build God's temple there in Jerusalem, as David, only David can, you know, in such an eloquent way, 
God talks about the glory of God. He says, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. And so the reason I bring that up and really talk about that is because as we start talking about the other part of godliness, I, I want to make sure that we understand and that we're rooted in the fact that God is the supreme being. God is nothing but glory. God is not a punchline. God is not a plot. God is the creator. He's the one who knows the number of grains of sand that are on this earth. And we should always think in terms of him with reverence and with respect. The, the second definition or the second layer there of the, uh, the term godliness as used in this particular text uh, talks about living in a pious or a holy manner. There's, there's another word that we've got to, to try to define a little bit. Being pious or piety means this is a person's inner response to the things of God which shows in your actions and in your life. It is having God at the center of your life. And that's where I want us to focus tonight. With God being at the center of our life. Now, I'm not talking about just saying, well, I know God. And I believe in Jesus and I believe in God. And man, I, I just, I love God. And then we talk about it. We come in here and we sing praise to Him on Sunday morning. We come in here on Wednesday evening and we study about Him. And then we go back to the world. Tonight, we're going to talk about what it means to live with God constantly in our lives. So when we're talking about piety and we're talking about living with God, I think it's more of a, let's think of it in terms of a lifestyle or a frame of mind. Okay? There's a, there's a movie that's near and dear to, to all jarheads. If you're a Marine, you know the movie. Clint Eastwood was in a movie called Heartbreak Ridge where he played a, uh, an old salty gunnery sergeant who was tasked with getting a bunch of misfit Marines and getting them back in shape, basically, and ready to be Marines and, and ready to go to war. <clears throat> There's a lot of one-liners that came from that movie, but one of the one-liners that, that kind of tr uh, transcends is one of the first things he did was he had these guys get haircuts and get back in the grooming standard and start looking like Marines. And he told them, he said, you're going to start looking like a Marine and maybe you're going to feel like a Marine. And if you feel like a Marine that maybe, just maybe, you guys will start acting like Marines. I think that translates over into a lot of different things. Even in this, for us to act like godly people and the Christians that we're to be called, we have to be in the mindset of a godly person and in the mindset of having God as the center of our lives. Okay, so a couple of things we're going to look at tonight is how do we obtain godliness or how do we become godly? I think the first thing we've got to recognize is it's not something that's natural to us. Okay, by no means. Um, Timothy, uh, or Paul, in his writing to, uh, to Timothy in uh, chapter 6, verse 11, Paul encourages Timothy to flee ungodly things and to flee the, the love of money and the worldly things and to pursue godliness. Okay, There's two words there I want us to, to look at and to think about. To flee and to pursue. And the thing I want us to, to focus on is those are both two action words. Those are verbs. Flee and pursue. And those things don't just happen. When you flee... You flee with a sense of earnest and zest. And when you pursue, you pursue something continually. And you're dedicated to it. Even an example, I spent most of my time on the fire department in Mobile downtown. 
So I got to do a lot of things and see a lot of really cool, fun stuff. <clears throat> and uh, I say fun, interesting. A lot of it was fun. Uh, we'd get called for shootings downtown. A lot of times in the entertainment district. And so, you know, we'd jump on our red horse and we'd ride down there. And we got on scene one time, got off the truck and got to looking around. And there were flip-flops and sandals all over the place. And I don't mean like four or five. I mean dozens on the sidewalk, in the street. And it was one of the first things that kind of caught my eye. And I didn't think on it too much because we had a job to do. So we went and took care of our business that we were taking care of. And when we were done, I got to looking around and it dawned on me. It was summertime. The young ladies who were down there in the entertainment area were all probably dressed in their sundresses and shorts and whatever else. And they were wearing flip-flops and sandals because it was summertime and it was warm. But when the shooting started, that's the one thing you can't do in flip-flops and sandals. You can't run, can you? You can't flee. So they were ditching their shoes and beat feet to get away from what was dangerous and get to some place that was safe. They moved with a sense of purpose to get away from what was dangerous and what was bad and get to a place that was safe. And so when we think in terms of fleeing evil, fleeing worldliness, we should move away from that with a sense of earnest that we want to be away from it because it's bad for us. There are bad things that are happening there. There's nothing good that's there for us. And of course, you think in terms of pursue, and I'll just tell you, I'll use myself as an example. When I met my beautiful wife, uh, I pursued her pretty heavily. And I dare say, even most of the men in here, they might shake their heads, well, no, she pretty much came after me pretty hard. <clears throat> My guess is most of you were taken with the beauty and the charms of your, your wife or your fiancé or whatever now, and uh, you pursued her pretty hard. Phone calls, flowers, gifts, cards, whatever we had to do, whatever it took, right? We pursued with a sense of purpose. We pursued because... We cared. There was a pursuit of love there. And so as we, as we think about fleeing and we think about pursuing, let's keep that in mind, that we should flee because there are bad things happening in the world, worldliness. But there is nothing but great things. There's nothing but love that we should be pursuing. So... Um, I think one of the first things to me that came to mind was how to obtain this godliness. It doesn't happen automatically. When we come up here and man, somebody comes forward and they say, you know, I, I just accept Jesus as my Savior. I believe in him. I love God. And I just want, want him to fill my life. And, and we're baptized and we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't automatically become godly people. Okay, and, when, and when I was doing this, I was wondering, why is godliness so far down on this list? You know, man, we're looking at, at, at all these things that we've talked about over the last four, five, six weeks, I guess. And why is godliness so far down the list? And it's because there are so many things that we have to get through to be able to get to the point to where we are godly. And I, knowledge and studying was one of those things that we did a couple of weeks ago that we talked about so greatly. Okay? So I think studying and learning what we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to act. And uh, in 1 Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy and encouraging him about his, uh, his teaching and his studying. He tells him, Have nothing to do with godless myths or old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both this present life and the life to come. Wow, this present life and this life to come. So that's one of those things that when I was growing up, I missed. Uh, as I grew up in the church where I did, it seemed like I was always being told to look at Judgment Day. It's all about Judgment Day. It's all about where you're going to spend eternity. 
It's all about heaven or hell. Okay? But I never really learned about God and what God can do for us right now in the present. And I know just from my specific life the difference that God makes in my life now and I know what a difference he's going to make in my life moving forward after this old world goes away and it will go away. Okay, Paul says physical training has some value but training for godliness has the greatest value. Now I know I don't look like it but I spent most of my adult life working out or in a gym or, you know, between the Marines and the fire department. There's a lot of type A guys, and we're all trying to see who's the toughest guy. And so that involves a lot of macho machismo stuff, always in the gym and those sort of things. And you can tell I'm at ease with that now. I've let that go. (coughs) And that's okay. I'm happy. I'm happy. And I know how great it feels to to go and get that workout in, opens your lungs up, get your blood flowing. You feel really good. You feel good about yourself. You feel feel good about everything. Okay, man, I just feel good because I feel healthy and I'm working out. How good do you think you'll feel if we devote the same amount of time and attention to training for godliness? We spend, we spend a lot of money and a lot of time in this country on physical training, physical fitness. There's gyms everywhere, exercise equipment. Man, you can't turn on the TV, and there's a mirror that works out, shows you how to work out now. I'm waiting for the one to come along where I just stand there, and it actually does the exercise for me, and I just get to watch myself work out. <clears throat> That's probably not too far away. But is it three days a week, five days a week? Do we, do we set time? In the morning, we get up 30 minutes early so we can work out. Do we make sure that there's time before we go to bed that we can go get on the gym or get on the treadmill? Do we pay $10, $25, $50, $60 a month to belong to a gym? And we dedicate that time and we dedicate that money to our physical training. How much training do we spend and dedicate to knowing God and being close to God? And I don't know if I'm stepping on any toes. I'm going to tell you something. My toes are sore. I've been stepping on them for about a week and a half now as I've been going over this. <clears throat> so join the club. Okay. How much time and how much effort do we put into? I got a buddy <clears throat> who hired on the fire department with me. And he, he's worked out every day of his life since he was 14 years old. They've rebuilt his body about three times. The shoulders and and and. Uh, ankles and knees and that kind of stuff. He's, he's worn them out. Okay, He put too many, too many miles on his body. He's worn them all out. But no matter the great shape that he's in, no matter how much he works out, one day that body is going to deteriorate and it's going to turn to dust. But what is left, our spirit, like we talk about all the time, Dale, that spirit, that who we are is still going to be around. And so that's where we want to be. That is what we should be looking. Now, there's nothing wrong with being in great physical condition, and there's nothing wrong with working out. Let me say that. That's awesome. But we need to make sure that our priority is to train ourselves for the promise of this present life and the life to come. So I think the second means of being able to obtain godliness is developing a closeness, seeing God as our Father, who He is and what He is. In Romans, Paul writes to the church there in Rome, and he says, The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Paul had been talking about how through Christ and and Christ's sacrifice, we're we're released from the bondage of servitude to sin. But what he's saying is God didn't release you from that servitude 
to put you and make you a slave again to him. God wants you to be his child. He wants you to be, he, he wants to be your father. He wants to have a close personal relationship with us. I was talking with uh, David Wolfgram a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we, we were sharing and talking, and he was sharing with me how he, uh, he really loves some special time that he spends every day with God because it really makes him feel close to God. And I, I shared something with him, and I'll, I'll tell it to you and uh, just kind of tell you, I don't know what it says about me. All of my adult life, I talked to myself. Anybody ever talked to themselves? We all... I feel better now because <clears throat> I have always talked to myself. But before I gave my life to Jesus and, and made God the center of my life, I talked to myself. And so if there was an issue, I would try to work that problem out in my own head with myself. But I find myself now, all day long, I talk to God. Anybody else do that? I talk to God. You know why? Because God's right there with me. Because God hears me. Because God wants to be close to me. And I want to be close to God. And I never feel like I'm alone. Never. And all of that changed the minute that I said, I'm yours, Lord. You know, you got me. I did it wrong all these years. I give it all to you. We have got to develop some type of relationship that we are constantly with God because God wants to constantly be with us. Is there anybody else who does anything through your day or through your week that helps you, you feel close to God or makes you feel close to God? Anybody? Because I am always looking for something new to make me feel closer to God. It's sitting right out there for us, isn't it? There's an open invitation. All we have to do is move towards him. And we're going to talk about that in, uh, in just a few minutes. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, but, but I know that, that talking with Dale, and I'm sure you probably do, uh, I love Christian music. <clears throat> I love listening to Christian music. And I, I listen to nothing but Christian music now. Well, I say that. I like college football, and so <clears throat> I do listen to uh, some sports talk radio from time to time, but, but listening to Christian music, it just reminds me all day of who I serve, what Christ did for me, and it really has a way of just, I can be in the middle of something and listen to a certain song, and I can hear that song, and I can turn it up there at work, and I go, wow, you know, that's right, you know. Jesus did do this. God is this with me. And it, it helps keep me in that frame of mind all day. Okay, Because I can listen to other things and I know in a very short period of time I can catch myself. My whole attitude starts to change. Whether it's it, about being aggressive. <clears throat> maybe it's music that I used to listen to you know, back when I used to work out and there was a lot of stuff that I listened to that was pretty hard, pretty aggressive music and, and I, I can actually feel my, my inside start to change. And so I try to keep that, uh, that positive influence going or that godly influence. So how do we continue to live in godliness every day? We've talked about Godliness is really about making God the center 
of our life and living with God in the center of our life every day. The thing we have to do is make that effort to pursue and dwell on godly things. Got a couple of verses here uh, in Paul's letter uh, to the Christians at Colossae. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Now, I want you to, to look. It says, set your minds on things above. He doesn't say, hey, every now and then, just make sure you think about God. He doesn't say every now and then, just stop and pause and take a deep breath and just say, man, God's pretty good. I'm, I'm so thankful for God. Or stop every now and then and just say, man, you know, I'm so thankful for what Jesus did. All right, now let me get back to, to my life, okay? Intermission over. Let's get back to our life. He says, set your mind on godly things, the things of above. James, in his writings in chapter 4, in verse 4 he says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity or an opposition against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. He continues in verse 7 8 and says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There's something there in verse 8 I want you to look at with me. Come near to God and he will come near to you. All we have to do is to pursue God and God will draw closer to us. Like we were just talking about earlier. It's right there in front of us and it's right there for us. God wants to be in the center of our life. Paul tells us in Colossians, stay away from the world. Get away from the world. You can't serve the world and you can't serve God at the same time. So how many of us try to walk on the edge? Okay? Try to walk on the edge. Again, what music do we listen to? What shows do we watch on TV? Um, what, what, what movies do we see? Where, does our, where do our influence come from? Do we still maintain it's not bad to have friends that are outside the church, but do we have people who influence our lives from outside who we should be influencing their lives instead of them influencing us? Do we get drawn into conversations that we shouldn't be drawn into? And sometimes I have problems with that. Like I said, I've got fat toes from where I stepped on my own feet putting this thing together, talking about it. Working with a lot of different fire teams and firefighters, you can imagine the kind of discussions that are they're having. The firehouse was always a place where basically anything goes. Okay, the truth is going to spill out, and there's no telling what's going to be said. It's easy sometimes to get drawn into conversations that we shouldn't be drawn into. When those things happen, that's when our light should shine the brightest. But we can't do that unless we have that spirit of God that dwells in us all the time and that we live there with God. And so there really is a choice. And this is where we go back to what we talked about earlier. There is a choice and there is an action that we must make and we must choose to pursue God in our lives. To every day find a way to make sure that God is in the middle of what we're doing all day long. Just because we live in this world doesn't mean that God can't be in the middle of our lives. Listen, think about what a blessing it is to think about that God can come to my house and live with me and my family. 
if I choose and I pursue God and try to pull him closer, he is going to pull close to me. It's there. It's there for all of us. <clears throat> I think we've all seen people walk tight wires and you know, walk on the edge of buildings. I watch those videos sometimes of those people hanging off the edge of buildings and I've got a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, a secret that <clears throat> I can go ahead and tell y'all. Uh, I'm not afraid of heights. I don't mind climbing a tall ladder to the top of a building and I don't mind rappelling off a building or out of a helicopter or something like that. But on the edge of a building, somebody better grab me because I'm going to get dizzy and I'm going to fall off that building. So I wouldn't be very good at that kind of stuff. But when I watch people walk that tight wire, when I see them walk on those edges of those buildings, you can tell they're always kind of struggling and fighting. But why is that? Because one wrong move and they're falling to their death. Why do we walk on the edge if we are walking on the edge? Why, why do we try to stay close to the world but we're still good people. We're still Christians. Well, the Bible doesn't specifically say that this is wrong, so I'm going to come hang out over here and I feel pretty safe about this. Why not step off of that edge onto a place where there's safety and security and you can exhale and there's a joy and there's a freedom and there's nothing but safety and there's nothing but good things happening in this present time and in the time of the future. So I've got one challenge for everybody. Moving forward for the rest of the month. I challenge everybody here and everybody who may see this to find some way for the rest of this month every day to draw yourself closer to God. Whether it's listening to Christian music, and again, I love Christian music. Man, there's some great artists out there. <clears throat> it's, it's not, I remember growing up listening to gospel music, and I was like, oh my goodness, you know, but, but the Christian music that's out there now. Christian music. Uh, find a faith-based movie to watch with your family. Watch faith-based TV shows. I'm probably on about my sixth trip through The Chosen now. <clears throat> I was under the weather last week, and so I sat at home, man, and I, I binged The Chosen for a couple of seasons again. Study time. Set aside some study time. Even if it's just before you go to bed, 30, 45 minutes, just reading God's Word. Go back to the Gospels. Okay, there's so much great stuff here that we, we talk about. Go back to the Gospels. Maybe you haven't read the Gospels in a while. Look at what words came out of the mouth of the teacher. The words that came out of Christ. What did he say? What did he have to say? How did he react to the circumstances of that day and the things that were thrown at him? I mean, he's our great example. Find some way every day to pull yourself closer to God. And at the end of the month, just tell yourself, Give yourself a judgment. Do I feel better? Do I feel closer to God than I did last month at the end of the month? And how great is it that I feel like I'm surrounded by God and that I'm in His presence? Because we are. We are in His presence at all times. So, does anybody have any comments or questions? see it all, yeah. But as I have matured, there's a second part to that, and it's, it's not fear. God's perfect love is going to cast out that fear. But he's everywhere all the time. And, but this verse here in James 4.8 says, if we draw near to God, he draws near to us. How can we do that if he's everywhere all the time? It's a heart thing. Right. Okay? And the scriptures we read earlier, not only the 
anybody else. I apologize, for 30 years I've been in presenter mode. And so I don't do a real good job of, of holding a, hey, let's talk about uh, a Bible verse or whatever. Uh, I'm used to clicking PowerPoints and, and passing out knowledge. So you have to excuse me. Sometimes I have a tendency to hog up the, uh, the speaking, but, but I learn more from everybody that are, that's here uh, than anybody will ever learn from me, that's for sure. Well, again, I want to tell you how much I appreciate y'all being here tonight and just being able to stand here before you. I've, I've shared with, with some of you before in the past uh, about prayer. And this is uh, just the last personal thing, and I'll, <clears throat> we'll, we'll get everybody dismissed. You know, a little over three years ago, I was, I was drowning in sin and in a sinful life. About as far away from God as I felt like I could ever be, so far away that I didn't think I would ever... There was no way to ever turn around and come back. To be able to stand here in front of y'all as my brothers and sisters here in this church, it, it's, it's the power of Jesus. And, and I just want to thank y'all for the opportunity to do that and to be able to share this with you. And uh, again, everybody has done such a great job up to this point with this series. And I know that we've got a couple more weeks and look forward to everybody else's uh, comments for the next few weeks. Thank you.